out to that tonight at 6 p.m. as well. So if you want to turn your Bible, you can turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. Also, uh, you can put your finger there because we're going to start in Luke chapter 24. As we uh, focus on the resurrection, we're looking at, we're studying the book of Luke right now, as you know, and uh, we're in Luke 5, but uh, we're going to skip a few chapters and get to 24 right to the end. Well, Lord, we just want to thank you, God, for, for what we have in Christ. Lord, it's so great to go through the week, and, and many of us are working or living uh, in, in situations or places, uh, uh, Lord, that just we are the only Christians we meet during the week, and there's very few others. And we come together in, on a Sunday morning, and, and we stand together and worship you and uh, with others who are praising you for the same reason that you have forgiven sin, you have given new life. It's your grace. And Lord, as we sang that one line about the hope that comes, God, that's what we celebrate this morning, the hope that comes through the resurrected Christ, the newness of life that you give. And so, Lord, as we open your word and, and, and see these things, I pray you'd help us to recognize in our own life the truth of this and what it means for us. And we remind ourselves that we, as we look under the author and finisher of our faith, what you are preparing for those who love you. God, we thank you for that wonderful truth you've given and the truth that it's, it's not something that I'm making up. It's something that is historic fact, something that we can set our feet upon. Lord, we thank you for that. I just ask you to bless this time as we go through your word in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Well, let's start uh, in Luke chapter 24. I just want to read the first 12 verses as we begin this morning. And it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and, and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and, and told all these things to the, the eleven and all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who were with them, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, stooping down, and he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves, and he, he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. You know, it's an interesting that it's April 1st, isn't it? Fool, April Fool's Day, you know, I don't have any story to tell you. Don't worry, I'm not going to lie to you this morning. You know, I really shouldn't probably stand here and tell you a lie. But, uh, you know, it's amazing how, how this day so many people think that what we are celebrating today are idle tales, aren't they? You know, so many think that. That it's just something that we've made up through history. And, and we'll look at that in just a second. But it's this moment that, that I just want to grasp. You know, it's what, 1986 and, and, uh, years, probably, if it was, it was crucified in 32 AD. You know, since that we've been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Over 1,900, almost 2,000 years, we have been celebrating this truth. But it's this moment and this day that these women and, and, and the men, the disciples that, were, that woke up or, or, or didn't sleep that night, who knows, and they, they get up in the morning and they go, the, the women at least begin to go. And it's, it's this moment of, of real hopelessness in the life of the disciples. You know, and that idea of hopelessness is something that is gripping many, many people today. Many people are having that. In fact, there's a huge uptake in that. And, and a lot of people attribute it to social media and all that goes on. They look at it and they say, well, look at all the stuff that's going on, how everybody's having this fabulous life, and I'm not. Look what they're eating, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How, and then they have all this wonderful stuff, and I don't. And, and, and people are saying that, uh, that teenagers especially are, are finding more and more hope, hopelessness in the fact that that everyone else's life is so wonderful and ours are, are not. And, and in this particular case, you can imagine why they were hopeless. I mean, think about what had gone on. Matthew was a tax collector. He was wealthy. He had everything set. He had his future pension all set. He was going to be all right. Jesus comes along, promises him that he's going to take, you know, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And, and, and Matthew leaves his, his, his wealth 
his position, all his future security, leaves it all, follows Jesus, and all of a sudden Jesus is put to death just a few years later. All this hope that he put in this one person is all gone. The women, you know, they'd followed him. They had gone around the country following him in that situation, and yet they come to this place now that Jesus has been put to death. And you see this several different places. The disciples had left the fishing business, and Peter, James, and John, and and, uh, Andrew had all left all that following this guy that was going to give, they had the words of life, he had the newness of life, he was healing people, he was doing all this stuff, and now he's been put to death. And and you've been in that situation, haven't you, where you thought something was going to work out so wonderfully, and it quite didn't work out so well. You know, you've gone after this, this is what's going to make me happy, or this is what's going to make me happy, or this this is going to bring fulfillment in my life. And, and you get to the end of it, and all of a sudden you come to a place that you're worse off than you were in the beginning because you've trusted in something that's not of God or not of right or not true or not holy or just. And you, you go after that, and you get to the point where you're just in this place of despair. And that's where these people are. They're in that place of despair. In fact, it says, Peter says, when the, when they, when the, when the word comes to him, hey, we've seen angels, the tomb's empty. It says that these are idle tales. I mean, this is nonsense. They are in that place. And isn't that the case? Sometimes when someone's in such that, that place of despair, you can talk to them about the truth, you can tell them the truth all day long, but it just doesn't grip their mind until they meet the risen Christ, isn't it? And it's me, that, that, that revelation, that experience that needs to take place. But I love this, this fact that even though that Jesus and all their hopes wrapped up into him, that as he went to the cross, these women decided to get up in that morning, take their spices, and they were going to go and anoint his, his body. I think that's a, just such a great thing. Because even though Mary, you can look at who it was, Mary Magdalene was one of them. You know, even though that Jesus has died, and even though that she, I don't think she expected him to rise from the dead, even though that he had told them, remember verse 7, he says, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified. The third day rise again. The angel's like, don't you remember Jesus told you this? Don't you remember this is what Jesus has said? But when you're in that place of despair, isn't it so easy to forget the words of Christ? You know, we just sort of forget the fact of his promises and what he said and what he's what he's done, and how he raised Lazarus from the dead just a couple of weeks earlier than this, you know, not long ago. And yet here he is in the situation where these women are at this place in despair. The disciples are in such despair. They don't even want to come out of their their house. They don't, you know, if we go out there, we're going to get associated with them. We might lose our life. We might get crucified with them. Let's just hang out here. But Mary Magdalene was one of these women that was just like, you know what, even though Jesus was put to death, I mean, think what God had done in her life already. We're told that she had seven demons cast out of her. So she was in this incredibly tortured place, and and, and a place where she had these, she was demon-possessed, and all that went along with that, and that she meets Jesus, and now he's cast out these seven demons from her life, and she's new in that sense, and she serves Jesus for all these years, and now he's dead, and yet she's still, even though she doesn't really recognize the resurrection, she still knows that Jesus has made her life better in that sense. And even though she comes to that place, and show, show her and the other women go off, and they, they come to this uh, to the tomb in order to uh, anoint his body. And, and, and you can imagine what it would be like in that moment when they get there, you know, that they, they come to there and they, they think, man, uh, you know, what are we going to happen? The stones rode away. They meet these, these angels that are there and, and they say, hey, he is not here. He is risen. And I love that question. Why do you seek the living among the dead? What a great question, isn't it? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen remember. And he starts with that thought. Before he even meets with them, remember what he has said. And you know what? That is where we take every thought captive, isn't it? We bring it to Christ. Remember what God has said. Remember what the Word has spoken, what the disciples have written, what Jesus uh, uh, proclaimed, what he taught. Remember these things. He told you this was going to take place. And when it takes place, they run back and they tell the disciples uh, the, the the word, and it says, you know what? These are like idle tales, nonsense to them. Now, I, I want to just pause for a moment because I think it's important for us to really uh, base our faith on something that's true. 
Uh, I don't want to just tell you this is great and wonderful, you should believe it because I do or because you will you'll have a better life or anything like that. You know, you, you follow him like Mary Magdalene. Jesus is dead, but he still made your life better. That's kind of what some people think religion really is. It's sort of some, it's a crutch for you. It'll help you get through life. But at the end of it, you're facing the same death everyone else faces and there's no real answer to that. So it's just sort of idle tales. Is that the case? You know, uh, scholars have looked at this for centuries, and the Bible has been attacked in many different ways and many different, by many different people. But, but there are certain facts that are historical that, that even uh, scholars from all different sides actually agree on uh, when we look at this. And one of these is the fact of the empty tomb. The fact that the tomb was empty is a fact, a historic fact that is agreed upon by pretty much all sides. In fact, one of the great proofs that the, the tomb was actually empty, and this isn't a later addition that the disciples decided to get together and they say, okay, how do we carry this on? All right, let's just, let's pretend and let's write this down that Jesus rose from the dead, all right? Let's all write that down, okay? Make sure everybody says the same thing, you know? You know, uh, the, a lot of people compare this, this whole thing to Watergate. You probably don't know much about Watergate, but back, back a few years ago or several years ago, 12 people lied and they, they couldn't even hold on to a lie for three weeks. You know, they tried to lie and say they didn't do it and all the rest of it, but the truth came out in three weeks. But they weren't faced with death. They weren't faced with any of those things. These disciples, they held on to it to the whole life. They suffered all their life. And then they went and put, were, were put on a cross or stabbed or, or had their head cut off or something like that. All of them knowing that this was true. But it's an amazing thing that they all agreed that the tomb was empty. In fact, one of the great proofs of the fact that the tomb was empty is that the Jews actually had to make up a story of why the tomb was empty. Even the enemies of God agreed that the tomb was empty. You know, so, so you look at that and say, okay, the disciples say the tomb is empty, the women say that the tomb is empty, but the Jews actually made up stories to explain away the empty tomb. That tells you right there that everyone in the place thought or knew the tomb was empty. The question was, what happened? Well, the Jews must have taken it what? <laughs> that sounds stupid. Why would they do that? They're trying to stop the whole thing. If the Jews had taken it, all they would have to do is go, uh, the body's right here, didn't rise from the dead, no Christian faith, you know? They didn't do it. The Romans, well, they didn't do it. They put guards on it in order to stop this whole thing. They didn't want this to happen because insurrection would happen. They would have this whole battle. They wanted to have all of that, ha- all that, that, that peacefulness in the society so they could get their taxes and all the rest of it. They didn't do it, and that doesn't make any sense. Well, this disciples took it. Well, as I said, all 12 of them, or 11 of them, well, uh, depending on what you think about John the Baptist, or John the Apostle John, uh, 10 of them went to their death believing a lie. Now, and, and, and you know that story, that someone might believe a lie and believe that it's true, but when you actually know that it's not true, and you see James get, you know, getting stoned for his faith, you might think, is it worth it <laughs> to, to hold on to this lie? You know, none of them got real rich. None of them got powerful. None of them became St. Peter or St. Andrew in their time. You know, they got persecuted, all the rest of it. Peter supposedly was put in jail or put in prison. He was, uh, some, the tradition sort of says that he was chained in human feces up to his knee for like nine months, six months, something like that, chained to a pole, couldn't lie down, and then was crucified upside down. You would think if it was a lie, at some point when you're standing there in human and feces, you're like, uh, I think I'm going to tell him that it's a lie. You know, I'm going to get out of this, you know. But no, he holds on to it for three, six, nine months and then goes and gets crucified upside down. Why would he do that if he knows it's a lie? Of course he wouldn't do that. All he would have to say, it doesn't make sense. It wasn't just Peter, it was all 10 of them. And so the fact that all 10 of them went to the cross, the Jews actually were trying to make up a story of why the tomb was empty. Scholars from all sides agree that the tomb was empty. And so when we say the tomb was empty and that Jesus rose from the dead, we are basing that upon a, 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 sim, a, a historic fact in that case. Now, what's another one? Well, the appearances, the fact that Jesus appeared to different people throughout. Now, again, you have three sort of ideas. One, they lied, didn't happen. One, uh, uh, that they all hallucinated. And, and, and two and three is that it actually happened. Well, we already kind of talked about the lie. It's kind of dumb to, to think that that's the case, that they all lied about it. And 500 people, he appeared to 500 at one time. So all 500 all had the same, first they either lied or they all had the exact same hallucination. 
so that everybody here had the exact same hallucination. The problem with that also is it wasn't just like, you know, a UFO. Did you see that light go across the sky? It was pretty awesome, wasn't it? Wow. You know, we all had this. We all saw it. Didn't really wasn't there, but we all saw it. That's a little bit different than Jesus standing there saying, hey, touch my, touch, put your finger in my hole in my hand, you know. It's a bit different. There's touching. There's food. They ate with him. It wasn't just a hallucination. And so no one really believes that anymore. That one's been tossed out as well. So if he didn't lie and they didn't hallucinate, we're down to the third one, that they actually believed that they saw the risen Lord. And, and scholars all across the spectrum agree that the disciples believed they saw the risen Lord. Again, another, uh, another picture here. So you have, you have the empty tomb, you have the appearances of God, and you have the Christian faith, the fact that it started. You see, it's one thing to be able to say, hey, let's, you know, if you're the disciples and you were going to make this up, again, what would you do? I would say, hey, you know what? Let's go to London and let's start something in London. You know, that's where we should go. Why? Because if we, tell, we start in London, nobody's going to know anybody that lived in Jerusalem. We could say whatever we want would happen in Jerusalem. Nobody's ever been there. They haven't seen it. They're not around. We can make up anything we want to make. I mean, that's what the, 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 the Church of Latter-day Saints did. They, they, started, they started it way off in, in Central America, and then the actual religion started up in New York City, and so they, uh, New York State. And so it starts up there, talks about here, that goes to there. They talk about rivers in the Book of Mormon that never even existed in the Holy Land because nobody would know if they existed or not. But that's not, what the, that's not what the disciples did. They started it immediately in the very place in Jerusalem at that very time. The Christian faith started. Now, when you think about that, we are worshiping Jesus, who we say came as a, a, a God, became a flesh, dwelt among us. He came from a, a nondescript town in a, in, in a, in a sort of a, a, a conquered place, Israel, and he came from, he was a poor carpenter who never left the state of Israel ever. He was only on the scene for three years, didn't last for a long period of time, never held public office. He never uh, attacked or had any victories or conquering things or any like that. He, and, 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 he, and he took 10 people or 11 people, and he used these 11 guys who were fishermen and tax collectors and zealots, none of them connected, none of them having any sort of position of power. And he takes these 10 or 11, these 11 guys and uses them to promote this gospel that 1986 years later, we're still believing in a guy who was actually crucified as a criminal at that time. I mean, when you look at it in that way, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, most religious leaders have their either a long time they've been around, or they, they did some conquering thing, or they, they, they did something like that. Jesus walked around, taught people, healed, three years, and that's it. Done. And at that point, now we have this whole thing. Now, it starts in Jerusalem, right there, right where they were. Why? Why is that so important? Well, all they had to do was go around and asking people, did Jesus really die? Well, yeah, we saw him. He, he, we, we all saw him. Did he rise from the dead? Well, you can go look at the tomb. It's right over there. You know, you go see it, you know. And so you have these things that, that all show that it, it was exactly what it says. So it's a historical fact, the empty tomb. The appearances are a historical fact that most, most scholars would agree. The fact that Christian faith started at that particular time in that very place and the way that it did, following the man that it did, all, all give credence to this fact that what we believe and what we have right here is exactly the truth. Now, some actually say that in 1, 1 Corinthians 15, it actually goes back, dates to within, within three years of the actual crucifixion and resurrection, that story that Paul wrote there was sort of a, one of those uh, repeatable phrases that people would go over. It was a saying that they would have. They, people didn't read back then, so they would teach them these phrases, kind of like songs and things. And so you would have that. And, and Peter learned that from, from uh, or Paul learned that from Peter and James right from the very beginning. And so you can track that back all the way back to just three years from the time that Jesus rose from the dead. When you look at that whole thing, what we're reading in this account is not something that we're just sort of hopefully making up and li listening to. But what has to happen is that, that even when we hear that, even when we hear all that's going on, even when we look at society today and look at what Revelation speaks about, what's going to take place at the end of the world, and how that we can see all these things beginning to move and, 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 and the pieces being put into place, you can see all that, people can see all that and say they can still explain it away in some way or another. Even Peter 
was saying, I, I hear what you're saying, Mary, I, I hear what you're saying, and yet it's idle tales. So what does he do? Peter arose and runs to the tomb. He runs, and he wants to experience it for himself. He wants to see it for himself. He wants to meet this risen Lord, and great, the great news is that Jesus appeared straight to him. Now, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Because not everybody in this room has received Christ and walked perfectly ever since. Somebody here has, I'm sure. Come on, put your hand up. You know. Ain't none of us have done that, you know? None of us have been in that place. And we can often think that, oh man, I'm, you know, God must look at me in some way. It's Easter, I got to go to church, you know, but God's not really looking at me and loving me in the way that he, because I'm not loving him back. Well, here's Peter, d- denied Christ three times. And what does Jesus do? Jesus goes, well, can you go tell Peter? I don't want anything to do with him, you know? No, no, Jesus appeared to him specifically, himself. He goes straight to Peter, private uh, audience, says, Peter and encourages it, and reaches out to him. I love that story, because what we have is we have something wonderful. We have the living hope. Now, I want to go over to 1 Peter, because what we have in this whole story of what's going on, what they're explaining, what that introduces to us, Peter himself is now going to explain it. 30 years on, walking with Jesus for all of these years, gone through all the things that have gone on that have gone on in his life. Now, some think that he wrote between 64 and 67 AD, so about 30 years from now, Peter's getting towards the end of his life, and he's saying this. You know, he's been walking with Jesus for 30 years. The risen Lord has, has met him there, a private audience, and bringing him back. He, the risen Lord cooked him breakfast while Peter was off fishing when he should have been waiting. Jesus was with him every single time. Peter was the one that was actually, that had disassociated with some Christians and got rebuked by Paul in front of everyone. And all through these times that Peter made mistake after mistake after mistake, Jesus never left him. Isn't it an amazing thing that now it's here Peter is writing this thing saying, praise, verse 3, praise or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has now been walking with Jesus for 30 years. Jesus has ascended into heaven. 30 years on, he is now saying, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because his according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, he's still proclaiming. The first thing that he comes to, he he welcomes them or he says, hello, how you doing? Lacked in foreknowledge of God. He he goes into that. But the first point is that you, he goes back to this idea of the resurrection. It's the resurrection that he focuses this whole thing. And and Peter's big, big, uh, I guess, word, if you will, is, is, is hope. You know, John really sp- focuses on love, and, and uh, Paul really focuses on grace, but Peter focuses on the hope that we have in Christ, and it all comes from the resurrection. And Paul said it, didn't he? Even though Mary Magdalene's life was changed for the better when Jesus had died, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, what did Paul say? Paul says, we are men and women most miserable because we are believing a lie. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the, fa- the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and what we celebrate on this morning is the most important fact in the New Testament. Now, all of it's important. And one thing I don't want to move away from, I think that, you know, like, let's not turn this into a Christian festival to celebrate Christ on Easter and go back to our own life for another day. You know, that we need not do that because every day in Jesus's life was important. What if September 23rd, Jesus would have sinned? What would have happened? Well, the resurrection would have, wouldn't have happened. It was, there was no, no meaning to it he, if he would have sinned. So September 23rd is just as important as, as Easter Sunday in that sense, in that he had to live every day of his life in tune and in fellowship with the Father. And the beauty of us is that we get that same thing because of the resurrection of Christ. We have a living hope, and that's what he says here. He has according to his abundant mercy. Now, I love this because when you read through this, these five verses, now we're going to, these three verses, we're going to look at uh, verse six and onwards tonight, but uh, th- this morning I want to focus on these three verses and it's, just let me read through it again. He says, blessed be the God and Father, and now look, look for our part, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, if you read through that, what what was our action? Well, the according to His abundant mercy, well, that's His. He has done this. What has He done? Well, He has caused us to be born again. Now, we need not ever move away from that idea of being born again, that we are born above, born new. We have a new life in Christ. We are sinners separated from God. And because of Jesus going to the cross and paying for your sins and my sins, and He rose from the dead as the first fruits from the dead, our faith in Him causes us to be risen from the dead and have a relationship with God. And we are forgiven, and now we are, have a new life. And that's what this born again is really all about, isn't it? That you have a new life. I was focused on myself. I was focused on my own life. I was focused on my hedonistic pleasure. But then when I'm a Christian, all of a sudden you're focused on Christ. It doesn't mean you don't deal with your hedonistic things and your issues of your life. You still got to deal with that. But your focus now is on Christ. You have a newness of life. Those things that, that, that interested you before no longer interest you. They only hinder you. And you're like, I don't want to be that. I can't believe I used to do that. That's wrong. Oh, oh, why would I think that? Why would I say that? Because you're a new person in Christ. And that's what he's saying here. He's like, blessed be God. Here he is 30 years on. And he's still celebrating, still thinking about the wonderful truth of the mercy of God. Why? Because Peter has experienced the mercy of God. 30 years on, he did not deserve to write this. Three times I even mentioned, and there's probably more than that, you know, he denied Christ. He, 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 uh, uh, he went fishing and led other guys astray. He, 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 he uh, disassociated with other Christians because other people and what other people might think. Three times, I've just mentioned, of three times that he did it himself and he led other people into his, his sin, and yet God continued to use him and bless him in that incredible way. Why? Because it's the mercy of God. And he can't even just say the mercy of God, can he? He's like, according to his mercy. Now, that would be awesome, the fact that God doesn't give us what we deserve. But he says, God, according to his abundant mercy. You know, it's like Paul, you know, exceedingly abundantly above. I, I can't say enough words to explain all that we have in Christ. And here, Peter's saying the same thing. We get this mercy of God, but it's not just mercy, it's abundant mercy. So if you're in that position and you've come in and you kind of feel a little dirty or separated, you know, that's the beauty of God that He wants to wipe you clean and set you on and move you forward again. It's an abundant mercy. Who does it come from? Well, it's not us. We're the ones who receive that mercy. We're the ones who need that mercy. But He's begotten us again to a living hope, and that's that point, isn't it? That, that because of Jesus has risen from the dead, our hope is not in the grave. Jesus is alive. The empty tomb is a historic fact. The fact that Jesus rose up into heaven in front of his disciples and they all proclaimed it and went to his death shows that very fact. And this living hope is what you and I get to live in. And what is this living hope? Well, he's now going to explain it. What is the living hope? Well, the living hope ultimately is the resurrection. Because Jesus rose from the dead, you and I have the living hope that we will also rise from the dead. We either rise from the dead if you die, and then you'll rise, to, rise into heaven, or the rapture will come, and we will all get to go up there and be with Him, one or the other. There's the living hope, that we will be raised from the dead, that we will be with Christ for all eternity. Now, I think that's important because so much today is focused on where we are now. Now, don't get me wrong. Tonight, we're going to talk about where we are now and what we live But we can never move away from this idea that the resurrection is the central point to our message. Because you know what? When we go off to all over the land, the resurrection is the most important thing. You know, when you're talking to poor people, slaves in the Roman Empire, you know, this idea that they were they were gonna they were gonna that a large percentage I can't remember exactly the percentage, the estimated percentage, but a large percentage of, of the Roman Empire were slaves, and many of, the, many of the church were slaves. Going into there and telling them that God wants you to be rich and healthy and wealthy and all the rest of it, they're slaves. They're never going to be free. 
That message will not resonate in the Roman Empire at that time because they would not be free. But the fact that they are resurrected and they have eternal life and that God is going to sustain them and strengthen them and they have the riches that's in Christ in their life right now, that is the message that works in all cultures, in all places. Rich, poor, every country is the same. We have a living hope. And so he's, here he is, 30 years on, calling these guys, hey, you guys are pilgrims, you're in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect, remember of the living hope, focus your attention on that. In fact, we're told in Peter that we are, we are or in, in Hebrews, we are to uh, fix our eyes upon Christ, aren't we? Looking unto Him. And that's the beauty of it. Because, why? Because when we have that, that hope and when we look according to that hope, what do we get? Verse 4, it says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. See, this is a beautiful thing. Again, what part of that is ours? Well, it's not ours. God has caused us to be born again through, through faith, which is ours, which we'll come to, to an inheritance. This inheritance is kept by the power of God. It's His. And we get to know that you know that in your, in, at the end of your life, you get that which God is going to give you, His inheritance. Incorruptible. It can't be changed. Th- thieves can't steal it. Moths can't uh, destroy it. There's no rust upon it, you know. You're not going to look one day and the market's going to crash and there goes your pension, you know, that kind of thing. You know, that is not going to, that's not a worry for us because we know that Christ is holding that. It's incorruptible. It can't be changed. It's undefiled. It doesn't change because of, of my sin or, or, or the things that have happened in my life in the sense that I can taint it. No, it's undefiled. It doesn't fade away. You know, so often that's the case. People come to the end and of, their, of their life, of their pensions, and they think this is the way it's going to be, and they get there, and all of a sudden the, the company's collapsed, or, or the, the market's gone down, or something like that, and they get far less than they think they're going to. It's, it's, this does not, it does not fade away. You see, when we have this truth, it's no wonder that Jesus says, set your mind on things above, isn't it? And that's what He said. Set your mind on things above, where thieves can't get in and break in and steal, where moths can't destroy it, where rust doesn't destroy it, that we, we, we store up our treasures there in heaven. Why? Because it's kept reserved in heaven for you. Isn't that a beautiful thing, that God is keeping it? Verse 5, he says, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. So not only does God have this abundant mercy, the living hope that comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, but now we are kept by the power of God. What is this power of God? Well, it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, I think that's so important for us to let that settle down into our spirit. The same spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that is working in and through our life. Now, that is so important for us because so often we look at ourselves or we look at what's gone on or we look at the task or we look at life and we think, I can't do it. This isn't going to be possible. I can't. And all I'm doing is I'm taking my eyes off of Jesus and looking at my own inabilities, my lack of education, my insecurities, what's gone on in my past. And my eyes are focused on that rather than on Christ. And the same power that has broken Christ from the grave, raised him to, to, new, to, to, to heaven, is the same power that keeps you and I. Now, I love that that we are kept by the power of God in our life, that He never lets go. In fact, we're told again in Philippians that He is going to complete the work that He has started, that God is going to complete that work within us. Now, what does that make me do? That makes me grab on and hold on with all my fear and tight. No, that makes me relax. You know what? God has me. You know, the first time you do something, whatever it might be, maybe you don't like to fly, the first time you fly, probably not the most fun thing you've ever had, you know? You're in this tube flying through the air and all these, uh, you know, this is crazy. I mean, you do it more often, all of a sudden you kind of relax in it, going, you know what, this isn't too bad, you know? The seats are a bit uncomfortable, you know, it's horrible, but, you know, I'm going to get there, you know, the chances of it, and you sort of relax a little bit. You rest in it. Why? Because you, you know it's, you're going to get to the end, you know? Same thing when you're first driving, you know, the first drive, you're like this, and pretty soon you forget that you're just, you're an autopilot, and you're not even supposed to go here, but you go here every time, so you just got to go that way. You're not even thinking about it. 
You just, just the way it is. You, you sort of relax in it. You rest in it. And this is this kept by the power of God. When we really understand that I am kept by the power of God, I'm no longer fearful about losing my salvation. I'm no longer fearful about that God's going to hate me and, and I'm waiting for that hammer to fall. I, I'm no longer worried about any of those things because I know that Christ is keeping me. And when Christ is keeping me, even when I blow it, His abundant mercies covers me because I have this living hope reserved for me in heaven. It's a beautiful thing because when we relax and when we rest, all of a sudden, God begins to open up our understanding to Him so much more. When you're afraid, the last thing you, what you're thinking about is you're thinking about a situation. You're aware of what's going on. All you're thinking about is this fear that's gripping you, you know? But here when you're kept by the power of God and you, 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 you know that and you rest in that, all of a sudden God can open up many different doors to allow you to do great things. In fact, there's incredible examples all through the scriptures of there. You know, Peter, Paul, you name it. Paul being beaten, his feet in stocks, earthquake comes, door opens. You know, what do you do? You run out of there as fast as you can. No, not, not Paul. I'll just hang out here, keep singing these praise songs. We'll, when we finish the fifth chorus, then we'll, then we'll go, you know. He just kind of just relaxes, you know. Hey, we're all here. When I, you know, I, I, you might have me in this, this prison, but I'm not, I'm not a prisoner. I'm free in Christ. And you know the story. That is the very thing, that peace that he had in his heart and the way that he handled that situation, knowing who he was in Christ is the very thing that led the Philippian jailer to the faith and, led and started a whole work in Philippi, all because he could rest in Christ. We need to realize that we are kept by the power of God, and there is no power greater than his. And what are we kept through? We are kept through faith. There is our part. Now, I think that is, again, just blows your mind, that that is all our part. All that I just read through, that comes through this resurrection that He is proclaiming to these people, the mercy, the living hope, the born again, the inheritance, incorruptible, the undefiled, the reserved in heaven, kept by the power of God, your part is to believe. That's it. Isn't that amazing? That that's all I am to do is I am to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God, all of a sudden that very word is the very, the very thing that gives power to me to live out the life that God has called me to live. His power lives within me because of the resurrection of, of, of Jesus Christ, because I have this new hope within me, because the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in my life because of Christ. We have we have a living hope in Him. And this is where we live. This is where we remain. This is where we stay. He says, you are kept by the power of God through, salva- through faith for salvation. This is what we're kept for. We're not kept for persecution. We're not kept for destruction. We're kept for salvation. Jesus is ca- keeping us for that very thing. He wants to bring us to the end. Now, salvation, again, can be broken down into three areas, you know, justification, sanctification, and glorification. The focus of this particular one is the glorification. He's already talked about the justification. He's already talked about being sanctified. But now he's talking about that we are going to be with, be with him, that we are going to make it to the end. You know, a lot of people will say that, you know, you, you can be too heavenly minded to be any earthly good, and I totally disregard that. I think that's totally wrong. I think the more heavenly minded you are, the more you can be used by God. The more you realize that, you know what, this is not my home. God is, where, where God is, that is my home. Does that mean that I'm gonna, I just need to be focused on that and not look around? No, we're going to look at that second. In fact, he says it here. He, he goes on, he goes, look, if, in verse 6, if, this is, if, if in this you greatly rejoice. And so this whole portion, verse 3, 4, and 5, he's like, hey, I want you to rejoice in this. This is awesome what we have in God. Rejoice in it. And then he says, then he's real honest, though now for a little while, if need be, you are grieved by various trials. You see, they are going through a trying time as as a church, as a group of people, as Christians, as individuals. They are being tried. They are going through difficulty. They are struggling. And in the midst of their struggle, he doesn't say, God is going to get you out of that. 
No, God's going to sustain you in that. And how is he going to sustain you in that? By reminding you of what you have in Christ. You have a resurrection. You have heaven. You might get kicked out of Rome. You might lose your business. You might lose your home. You might lose all those things, but you have Christ. Even though now you are grieved by various trials. Oh, Bryce, you don't understand what I'm going through. And I don't. But I understand that these people went through the very same things you and I go through, except they didn't have a refrigerator they could go open and look at all the food, and they didn't have a job they go to that would pay every single week. You know, they, they didn't have any of that kind of stuff. The cars that drove them everywhere and all this stuff that in our, at our fingertip. And yet they went through the very same things that you and I go through. And yet here he's pointing them to this fact, this spiritual aspect of our faith. In fact, there is a heaven, there is a resurrection, there is a, a newness of life, there is a living hope and a, an inheritance, and you're not going to see it here. The inheritance is going to be there. That is what should cause you and I to rejoice so that we can handle the trials and tribulations that come our way. I mean, you ever been in that situation where you're going through something tough, you're like, Jesus, just come now, just come on. This week, anytime, you know, just come, you know. Just come take us, you know, just bring this over. You know, I just want to get out of this situation. You know, Paul he had that same thing. He's like, I want to go be with God. But you know what? It's probably better if I stay here for you. So I'm stuck here, you know, you know, because these guys had this eternal perspective. And when we have that eternal perspective, all of a sudden the insults that come against us, the fact that you might have got put, uh, you know, passed over for a promotion, the fact that someone else gets this or that or all the rest, all of that begins to sort of have less and less influence in our life because that's not what I'm living for. And the Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday, brings us back to this thing that this is what it's all about. It is all about what Christ has done. So I hope that we will have that same rejoicing in what we have in Christ. Now, that doesn't mean when you leave here and you face what's going on tomorrow and the next day and all the rest, that we don't have to trust and believe and, and walk with God in it. But in the midst of that, we can have the joy that comes from the inside of a relationship with the Father. Now, as we finish here this morning, I want to go back to that idea in verse 3. It says, "'Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.'" who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. And that, that thought that he has begotten us again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, you might be sitting here, and, you, and I've just given, went through all the facts, the facts of the empty tomb, the facts of the appearance, the fact that Christianity started where it started, and the, and the historic fact, and scholars agree. I can talk about this kind of thing, about the inheritance that we have, and the facts of this, and, and how do we know that? Well, when, God per, when, when the Bible says this is going to take place, you know, the world is all going to move to a cashless society. What are we seeing? The, the world's coming to a cashless society. God uses all of these prophecies all through the Old Testament and New Testament to point us to the fact that the Bible is true, so that when we come to this kind of thing and we go, we wonder if this is true or not, well, God was right here, 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 here. Well, I got a long time to say all of the times he's been right, but, you know, I think there's like a thousand prophecies or something like that, you know, just huge amounts to show that this is the truth, but you can be faced with all of that, but until you open your heart and receive the risen Christ, sometimes it doesn't really matter. You're just like Peter, idle idle thoughts. This is idle talk. It doesn't make any sense. And so the question is, will you believe? It's not that can you believe, you can, but will you believe? Will you say, you know what? I have traced after this and come to nothing. I've gone after that and only brought despair. I've tried this and it hasn't still brought that, 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 that what I'm looking for. Well, you see, because you're missing out on what God has created us for, and that is fellowship with Himself. And he is, that's what He's created. Now, you can go after that, and you can go after this, and it'll fill you for a time, you know? Sin's pleasurable for a season, isn't it? But all of a sudden, that season ends, and it ain't no more pleasurable, is it? You know, all of a sudden, the pain starts to happen. The trials begin to come. Because you've come to that place where there's just that despair. Well, Christ wants to meet you right here and right now. The fact is that each one of us have sinned and fallen short. That means we've broken God's command. You have, honored, you have not honored your father and mother the way you should. 
You have not, uh, you've had other gods before him. You have lusted in your heart. You have broken the commandments of God. Every single one of us in this room have. And when we do that, we have, have this separation between us and God. That's what this is all about, that Jesus came and walked a sinless life, lived a sinless life, went to the cross and took had you in mind and said, I look at that guy, Bryce, he's a failure. You know what? He's got all this sin upon him, but you know what? I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die for him. I'm going to take his sin upon me and pay his price. And all he has to do is, is to trust me. All he has to do is say, God, forgive me. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. And if I say that and I mean that and I want him to do that, you will have an experience with the risen Christ. You will have a change that will take place that Peter uh, was hiding in the upper room all of a sudden proclaims to 3,000 Peter people. Paul was, was persecuting the church, meets the risen Christ, completely changed and becomes who he is. Mary Magdalene, uh, uh, he's, she's uh, demon-possessed, meets Christ, and is totally changed. God changes our life, and it's only Him that can do it. Now, you can hear all these things, but this last bit, all that God has done for us, but that last bit is your part. Will you believe? Well, Father, I thank you for your truth.